Good afternoon, everyone. I am glad to see you after months of preaching to that camera right there. This is really nice. I'm glad you are here. Uh, so every week when you guys are not here, we do something, and I'm going to do it right now, guys. If, or does, is it too late? Okay. So I clap my hands, and what that helps the guys do is get the soundtrack and the video track lined up. Okay? So you can join me on three, one, two, three. Oh, you guys are great. I have some announcements to make, so let me uh, kind of go over these quickly. You'll see that the doors down there are out of place. I mean, there's a sign on them. We don't want people going into the other buildings. And the reason is, after we're done tonight, we sanitize everything. And so if we don't know where people have gone, that becomes a big problem. So we try to keep people in the places where they're at. So appreciate your help with that. The Lockwood ladies sewed uh, masks. I mean, lots of masks. And we're so grateful for them and the work that they put into that. Just wanted to do a shout out to them for that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a, a congregational meeting June 9th. That's the plan anyways. Now that could change. Everything is fluid right now. But among the things we're going to be talking about is the PPP. There's been a lot of controversy about that, but we're going to vote on the PPP and whether to return that money on the 9th. And also, the elders believe it's God's will to present Kate Esterline to the church family for approval as the part-time children's ministry director. So there will be an opportunity to vote on that on that night, too. So if something happens where we can't do it that night, we will let you know, but that's how things are planned right now, Tuesday, June 9th, 7 o'clock here. Uh, there are all kinds of things on the website. So if you need information, go put the Lockwood website in your favorites and go check out what's there, including Sunday school classes. So Kevin and I have done a couple Sunday school classes, and we'll do more online. So you can get on there and do a survey of the Psalms, for example. Or more recently, we did key biblical words what they mean and why it matters. And you can look at that. The classes aren't long, less than an hour, but they give some good information. There's also lots of other fun things and informative things on the website. I'd encourage you to go there. We're still doing Go Deep online, so if you want to join us for Go Deep, you can find the questions on the website, you can find the link to Go Deep, and you can join us in a Zoom meeting, and we're enjoying that. It's a good time to get together. We are not doing a Zoom coffee time this week, so tomorrow. Uh, we may rethink that. We just have no idea how many people are going to come, how many people are not, whether our Zoom coffee time is going to have two people at it or not, but we'll find out, and we'll try to plan accordingly. I am glad to have you here. We're glad that you're here and able to worship together. Let's worship the Lord now. I had planned on reading this by myself, but I'd like you to read it with me because it would be nice to hear you all read with me. Call to worship. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Adonai, my great Lord, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Those are the names of the Lord. We're going to sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. 
you this morning, this afternoon actually. For some who will watch, it'll be the morning tomorrow. But you are the Lord over time and over space. You receive our praises because your son, with the blessed name Jesus, came and redeemed us for you. And we worship you, Lord, our King and our Savior, the Redeemer of mankind, the one who is worthy of all praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's continue worshiping. If you feel like standing, stand. If not, you may continue sitting. <laughs> To the 
Close to your 
pray together for our church family and our community. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day when we can be back together, see each other's faces. Lord, I pray that while we're here, we'll not only have the joy of seeing each other, but the blessing of hearing from you, which you speak to us today. Lord, you know better than we do that your people are going through a hard time. And I pray that you will encourage and instruct and help us. Lord, our nation is going through a difficult time and people are unemployed and worried. I pray that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of the love of God and the love of his people, will ring out during this time. And Lord, some of our people here have suffered the grief of loss. And we pray that you will comfort and encourage, that you'll use your people to bear up those who are burdened. Show us how we can do this. Use us for good and for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we'll be looking through the chapter, but um, in a few moments I'll read for you verses 4 through 11. Years ago, a farmer told me that he doesn't like to get too much rain in the weeks right after planting because the corn won't need to send its roots deep to get nourishment. So if there's enough moisture near the surface, the plants will root near the surface. And then later when the hot days of, of July and August come and dry out the ground, there won't be enough moisture for the plants to flourish and the yield will be down. We're like that too. It may seem counterintuitive, but no one flourishes without a fight. That is true both of families and of individuals. Flourishing doesn't happen in the absence of sustained effort. It happens because of it. If people go through it well. Individuals and families that don't go through it well, don't endure hardship in healthy ways, don't flourish. And they may look good from the outside, like a nine foot corn stalk looks good. But like that corn stalk, they won't be bringing good into God's world. Parents like me want their kids to flourish, but they also want their kids' lives to be easy. They want success right there at the surface. They, when their kids are younger, they want their kids to have sports triumphs, academic honors, scores of friends. But if life is always easy, those kids won't root deeply and the time will come when they don't flourish. But when is life easy, either for adults or for kids? Financial uncertainty, sickness, loneliness. It sounds like COVID-19, doesn't it? But there needn't be a pandemic to experience hardship. Long ago, the author of Hebrews wrote this brilliant letter to help people who were going through a very difficult time. They were harassed, they were mocked, they were refused jobs. Some of them had their property confiscated and were put in prison. The book of Hebrews urges readers not to give up, explains why they shouldn't give up, and tells them how to avoid giving up. The letter reaches its climax in the chapter we're looking at today. Chapter 12 is the climax of this letter. And we're gonna look at it again next week. Today we'll discover five things we need to know in difficult times. Next week we'll look at four things we need to do in difficult times and three things we need at all costs not to do. So let me read our section for us. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm gonna read verses four through 11. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, or literally under blood. And if you're part of Go Deep, if you come on, to Go Deep uh, on Wednesday night, we're gonna talk about that verse. 
and you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. This is from the Proverbs. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son isn't disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who are trained by it. In the verse immediately preceding the ones that I just read, the author puts into words the very real dangers his readers were facing, which we also face. The danger that we might grow weary and lose heart. A literal translation of the Greek phrase might go, lest you weary your souls and come loose. Think about how often we have heard of some pastor or church leader who's been caught up in scandal. Many of these people are, to all appearances, genuine followers of Jesus who've been a real blessing to his church and to the world. So what happened? How did they get caught up in sexual sins and gambling addictions in episodes of rage? I'm sure there are lots of reasons, but one, I think, is that they are soul weary and lack the strength to resist temptation. The word translated weary here is frequently used in the scriptures of someone who is sick. So when St. James writes to the believers and says, is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over him. That's the word he uses. The word sick is the same one translated weary in this verse. Whenever we're going through prolonged difficulty, we are at risk of contracting soul sickness. The Greek word the NIV translates as lose heart means something like come loose or come untied. It pictures a person who is coming apart at the seams. What keeps the seams from unraveling is a person's soul. The soul integrates thoughts, feelings, will, and body into one person. But if the soul gets sick, the integration begins to fail. The body won't carry out the heart's decisions. And the heart's decisions are made over the mind's objections. When the mind and heart and body are out of sync, life starts falling apart. Soul sickness is always a possibility, but it is especially so in times of prolonged hardship, like right now. Our author wants his readers to understand the dynamics of prolonged hardship and the dangers that come with it. So he lays out some things that people need to know to successfully navigate through hard times. We'll look at those things in Hebrews 12, and then we'll add one from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. It will help you whenever you encounter hardship, whether it's sudden trial or prolonged difficulty, to know the five truths we're about to look at. But knowing them in the abstract will not be enough. You actually need to remember them and think about how they apply. Otherwise, you will be less likely to do the things that will help you endure, and you will be more likely to do the things that will cause you to come apart at the seams. So first thing, first thing we need to know is that trials will come and they will hurt a lot. Somehow we've got the, the idea that hardship is an outlier and pain an aberration while ease is normal and comfort is our right. Some people, like 
for example, Buddhists and Christian scientists teach that suffering is an illusion, while others like the prosperity gospelers teach that suffering, though it's real, is shameful and unnecessary. That is not what Jesus, his apostles, the prophets, or the evangelists taught. St. Peter, for example, wrote, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Suffering is not strange. It's normal. When his friends in Thessalonica were going through a very difficult time, St. Paul sent his surrogate, Timothy, so that, and I'll quote, no one would be unsettled by these trials. And then he added, you know quite well we were destined for them. Among the sure promises of Jesus is the one we don't like. In this world, you will have trouble. And he said similar things time and again. Suffering is woven into the fabric of a world that is out of sync with its creator. A few years ago, the staff at Bridger Wilderness Area in Wyoming posted some of the comment cards that they receive during the year. Let me read you a few. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Bridger's right in the middle of the Teton Mountains. Too many bugs and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness. Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. Too many rocks in the mountains. <laughs> the coyotes made too much noise last night. Please eradicate these animals. And, and finally, a McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. Those people, maybe they were joking, I, I'm not sure, but those people don't seem to understand what a wilderness is. Bugs, rocks, coyotes, and steep climbs, they come with the territory. What our author is telling us is that suffering comes with the territory. And people are not exempt just because they belong to Jesus Christ. Trials will come and they will hurt a lot. In Hebrews 12, 4, the author says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. They hadn't, but they might. And many others had, as the previous chapter makes abundantly clear. In verse 2 of this chapter, we're reminded that even the author and perfecter of the faith himself, the man of sorrows, was acquainted with shame and suffering. Don't think that pain was unavoidable back then, but we've moved beyond that now. In our day, people around the world are suffering hardship just like they did when this letter was written. And you don't need a pandemic for that either. Last December, the British Foreign Secretary reported that in parts of the world, the persecution of Christians is at near genocide, his words, near genocide levels. No one said this is a picnic. Life is hard and it always has been. Isaac Watts, who was the Chris Tomlin, Matt Redman of his day, a guy who wrote something like 750 hymns, hundreds of which are still sung today, hundreds of years later, was born into a time of political turmoil. England had just gone through civil war, was about to go through a second revolution, and then began two generations of a divided kingdom with constant warring. There were flagrant injustices. Watts himself was not permitted to attend England's top tier universities, this genius of a man, because he wasn't an Anglican. In 1721, a year of instability and intrigues, Watts wrote this hymn. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Isaac Watts knew better. And so did the author of Hebrews. He wrote in verse 8, everyone undergoes discipline. Not some people. Everyone. No one is exempted. 
So the first thing to know and to remember is that hardships and trials will come and they will hurt a lot. The second thing to know is that we can choose how we go through hardship. This is from verse 7. We'll go into, into this in more detail next week when we look at what to do and not to do during times of hardship. But for now, it's enough to know that we have a choice in the matter. Now, we have no choice as to whether or not we will endure hardship, but we do have a choice of how we will endure hardship. And that choice makes a real difference emotionally, relationally, and every other way. Next thing we need to know, God knows. God knows. He knows the course marked out for us. That was verse 1. He knows where the obstacles are, and he knows how to get us through them. God not only knows the course marked out for us, literally laid before us, he knows us, what lies within us. He knows what we can handle and what we cannot, and he will not allow us to undergo trials that are too much for us. Over the last few years, we've had a number of young people from Lockwood join the Marine Corps. And when they got to Paris Island, as you can imagine, they met a drill instructor who's called drill instructor because he drills recruits on proper etiquette, like how to enunciate clearly, how to fold a napkin after your meal, how to extend your pinky finger when you're drinking tea. That's not what they found, is it? They found a DI who was merciless. The drill seemed unbearable. They and their fellow recruits were pushed to their limits. And why? Because their DI had come from home from Iraq or Afghanistan and knew it might take everything these young men and women had and more to survive and keep their fellow Marines alive. They knew what their recruits could handle and what they couldn't better than the recruits themselves knew. Listen, God knows. He knows what's coming, knows what you can handle. As St. Paul put it in 1 Corinthians, he is faithful and will not let you be tempted. That word could also be translated tried or tested. He will not let you be tested beyond what you can bear, but when you are tested, he'll provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. See, if we don't know this in the moment, we will not trust God when hardship comes. And trust is the only vaccine that can immunize against soul sickness, the sickness that causes people to come apart at the seams. Hardships will not make you come apart at the seams unless you're soul sick. Trust in God is the only antidote. Another thing we need to know. Our Father God allows suffering because it performs an important function for which no other means exists. Suffering is a road no one wants to take, but it leads to a place no other roads go. To holiness. That's verse 10. God disciplines us that we may share in his holiness. If you say, I don't care about holiness, I'm no monk, I'm not a priest, I just want to be happy, then you don't understand holiness. Holiness is the state where joy and peace are located. Holiness is like clean air after smog. It's like light after dark. God wants us to share in his holiness, in part at least, because our happiness depends on it. Without holiness, verse 14 says, no one will see the Lord. Holiness is the state of healthiness and flourishing. Holiness is so important that God will use insecurity, grief, and pain to produce it in us. Now, it's not that he inflicts such things on us. He's not like that. But when such things come, he will not hesitate to use them for our great and lasting good. 
The only question is whether we'll use them for our good. A fifth thing, which is itself a summary of all the others. This is found in verse 10 as well. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God, our Father in heaven, disciplines us for our good. Included among the goods produced by God's discipline are the priceless treasures of verse 11. A harvest of righteousness, so right relationships with God and with each other. What a beautiful thing that is. And the blessing of peace. We need a word about that word, discipline. When I was growing up, discipline meant one thing, punishment, meant the belt. I got, and occasionally the razor strop because my dad was a barber. When I got disciplined, it was because of something selfish or malicious or willfully disobedient that I had done. Discipline was to be avoided by any means, uh, evading, hiding, lying, the word translated discipline in this passage doesn't mean that. It's, not, it's, it's training, not whipping. This is a word that would be used of training a child to tie his shoes or a young man to tie a tie. It's a word that would fit spring training in baseball or a training regimen at the gym. Training always has a purpose. People who undergo it and make use of it can do more after they have been trained than they could do before. Training helps us achieve what trying, however earnest, however strenuous, cannot do. Training is important in every one of our lives. Please don't forget this. Our good is never out of God's mind. Never. But we will think it is when we go through hard times if we think our good is just our ease or the preservation of our routine or our so-called possessions. We're like a tourist at, at, at Bridger, I mentioned earlier, for whom a cell signal is the only good he cares about because he wants to finish a game of Fortnite with his friends. And so he misses the awe-inspiring Grand Tetons and the turquoise lakes and the singing streams. He misses the moose and the grizzly. He thinks his good depends entirely on a connection to a cellular network. And you know what, we're not so different. We think our good depends entirely on keeping a connection to our money, our health, our reputation. See, we so lack imagination. The good we can envision and to which we are committed, I mean with, with a grasp that cannot let go, is a child's trinket compared to the awful good, the glorious good, the thrilling good God has planned for us. The promises of the Bible regarding us are breathtaking. The earth we live in will be transformed, a metamorphosis, an eco-resurrection. No more decay, no more death, no more second law of thermodynamics. The most out there science fiction movie you've ever seen or book you've ever read doesn't even come close to the biblical promises. We will be changed. Fear will be gone. Can you imagine? I think for almost all of us, we won't even realize it until it happens. It will be like lifting a 500-pound weight off of us. We will be immortals, glorious, shining like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. See, I think the work of subduing and ruling earth was just a training exercise for subduing and ruling the universe in love. We failed here, but God hasn't given up on us. 
I appreciate Dallas Willard's shorthand for what awaits us. We will belong, and what a beautiful word that is, belong. We will belong to, and here's Willard, a community of unspeakably magnificent personal beings of boundless love, knowledge, and power. That is, we will share in the joyful life beyond all imagination of the Trinity itself. Now two notes, and then we're done. One, this is only possible because of the love of God and the sacrifice of Christ. We didn't make this happen and we can't earn it. It is all grace. And two, we must not give in or give up on so great a future because of current hardship, whatever that hardship is. Now, how to avoid giving up is the subject of next week's message from Hebrews chapter 12. I'd encourage you to read the chapter, asking the Spirit of God to show you things in it before we get together. All right, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, you are offering us glory and we're playing with trinkets. Lord, would you open our eyes, illuminate our hearts that we might see the glories of your calling and the riches of your inheritance in your people. Lord, we'll not see this on our own. We will not see it in the midst of our troubles without your help. So help us. In the name and for the sake of your Son, who is our Lord, Jesus. Amen. Now a couple of announcements and then we'll be dismissed. So first of all, announcements about offering. You can of course give online and uh, you can text to give and you can do all of that at the website. So www.lockwoodchurch.org and you can go there and give at any time. But we are not passing offering plates during this time. We have set baskets out at the cafe tables in the back of this room and out on the round table in the middle of the lobby. So if you have come prepared to give, would you please do it that way today? Secondly, um, we're gonna be dismissing you by rows today. So we kind of came in in a scattered way and that's how we're gonna go out. So we'll dismiss you in a moment in that way. Thirdly, it's so good that you guys are here. You know what? I, I, the last few weeks have been pretty trying weeks. And uh, we've had all kinds of debates about things, including debates about whether to mask or not to mask. Do you know what? We're the people of Jesus. There's something more important than all of this other stuff. We belong to each other. And by the grace of God and the love of Jesus, we belong to God. And so the chance for us to be together again is a wonderful thing. So we're going to dismiss you. And what I'd ask you to do is just watch the folks who come in front of you out. And then after they've gone, would you go? And I'm not going to do it row by row because I'm going to come up here. And if you have a prayer request, I will be a prayer helper today. So, or actually, I come over here. So I invite you to come up if you have a prayer need, and we'll pray with you. Otherwise, at any time, you can send prayer requests to office at lockwoodchurch.org, and we will pray. Blessings. Thank you.